It would be no exaggeration to say that Halifax, Nova Scotia owes its existence to the mighty citadel that overlooks the bustling port city of Halifax. When the British military arrived here and saw this large hill overlooking the harbor, they established a settlement here in 1749 and they built this fortress on the hill to protect the city from potential invaders who might try to attack Halifax by land or sea. The Halifax Citadel was built in a distinctive star-shaped design which gave the troops stationed here a clear shot from every possible angle the enemy could come at them from outside the wall. They could point their muskets down into a defensive ditch around the fort and blast invaders with muskets and cannons that lined its walls. It's easy enough to see why no enemy ever dared to attack the Halifax Citadel. No longer an active military station, today Parks Canada operates the site as a tourist attraction called the Halifax Citadel National Historic Site of Canada. We spent the day immersing ourselves in a living history exhibit at the Citadel. The staff, dressed in military uniforms from a bygone era, showed us life as it was for people at the time when this fort served its purpose. Later in the evening, we came back to the historic fort to explore another layer of mystery that has captured the imaginations of locals and visitors. The Halifax Citadel has a reputation as one of the most haunted places in Nova Scotia. Tales of ghostly figures, unexplained sounds, doors and windows opening and closing on their own, and other strange happenings have become intertwined with the Citadel's storied history and many believe that the spirits of those who once defended this fortress still roam its corridors, bound in duty, even in the afterlife. During that two-year time period, there were two regiments here. There was the Scottish Regiment, the 78th Highlanders, you can tell us apart from the, uh, the kilts. And then there was also the 3rd Brigade Royal Artillery, an English regiment that was, as the name suggests, uh, in charge of all the artillery here on the fort, as well as other forts and batteries all over the area. Yeah, so uh, the centralized room here, uh, the 78th Highlanders were actually an infantry regiment, and uh, <coughs> They what was been, their name? The 70 Highlanders? The 78 Highlanders. Oh, the 78 Highlanders. The 78 Highlanders. So they would have been coming here uh, <coughs> after uh, the wars in India uh, and between 1862 and 1869 and 1867, I mean. And uh, when they fought in Malta, Java, and Sai. And they basically would have come here, and this would have been that third downtime because uh, this base was never actually attacked. It was meant to be a deterrence. Uh, for many attacks on the giant naval base that was down in Halifax. So the 70 Highlanders were basically stationed here uh, because it was their downtime. This was sort of after uh, after intense fighting in India. 
And this was basically the British military's way of sort of giving them a little rest period for a couple of years before I stationed to, to any other intense fighting they might have to face. Thank you. So, yeah. Can we get this tunnel here? Yeah. This is what the shine of the shoes and. Oh, the red coats. Yes, you guys this can absolutely in. try wearing red doublets if you want and uh, whatever, whatever you want. Really, Take got. a picture of me. I'll put it on. Oh, yeah. Hey. And the bonnet, too. So, baby, you're a red coat, huh? Uh, you I've are been, a red coat. I've been called worse. Okay, so you're right. <laughs> I'm yeah. it's, uh, Here we go. Yeah. Let me help you. You got it? Okay. Here. Try wearing that. Hold on. Dressed in the uniform of the 78th Highlanders and the Royal Artillery, the historic interpreters create a living museum by wearing the same uniforms those regiments wore in the 1800s. The 78th Highlanders guard the Citadel's entrance and conduct marching and band drills on the parade grounds. The staff is mostly college students who attend one of five degree-granting institutions of higher learning in Halifax. The British founded this city, but Scots have outnumbered them over the years. In the last Canadian census, 28% of people in Nova Scotia were of Scottish descent. The British were 16%. In fact, the name Nova Scotia is Latin for uh, New Scotland. Modern. Halifax residents proudly refer to themselves as Haligonians. They love their traditions, and the Halifax Citadel plays a big role in their local customs. Every day at noon, the Citadel's 3rd Brigade, Royal Artillery, fires a cannon that can be heard across the city. The noon gun has been a tradition here since 1857, for no reason other than to announce the noon hour. According to a local story that keeps being repeated, someone forgot to warn the attendees of the G7 convention about the noon gun when they met here in 1995, and it led to a laughable scene that people here still cherish all these years later. All of the dignitaries from around the world, including U.S. President Bill Clinton and British Prime Minister John Major, were outside the convention building for a group photograph when the cannon blew. All of the heads of state, believing they were under attack, hit the deck, and the Secret Service fell on top of them. When they realized the coast was clear, they all just readjusted themselves and went on with the photo. How often do you have to do this? Okay. This is rainwater that gets collected in there? No, I, we're cleaning it. We put water in there to clean it. Oh, I see. Okay. All right. You don't use these, do you? We use it every single day. What is that? Black powder. You shoot these off? Yeah, every single day. For what purpose? Signal. Tradition. And it's 12 o'clock. It's one of the longest standing traditions in Halifax. Canada too. Okay, head down. I had lost track of time. My wife was ready to head to the tour bus. She was worried about us being left behind. But nonetheless, we'd soon be returning to the Citadel to spend an evening with the spirits. There have been 36 documented ghost sightings at the Halifax Citadel, one of Canada's oldest national historic sites. 36 eyewitnesses to the restless spirits of long-departed soldiers and civilians who linger within these stone walls, bound by duty or tethered by unresolved tales of love, tragedy, foul play, and cruel twists of fate. Among the countless ghosts that are said to roam these hallowed grounds, none is more notorious than the spirit known as the Grey Lady. Witnesses have seen her walking past windows and around the corridors, wearing a flowing white dress. She walks through locked doors and walls and disappears when approached. Researchers here believe the Grey Lady is the ghost of former Halifax resident Cassie Allen, and she's wearing a white wedding dress stained with tears. She was supposed to marry a soldier who was stationed at the fort, and the night before the wedding the soldier committed suicide. He got into an argument with another soldier about the legality of the wedding after it was revealed that he had a wife in a psychiatric hospital in Bermuda. 
After the fight, the soldier hanged himself, and he was discovered dead the next morning when a carriage driven by two white horses arrived at the Citadel to take him to church. Cassie never got over his death, and her ghost is still looking for her husband-to-be. Our tour guide provided us with ladders in order to take us into a dark tunnel where a chilling sob is said to often pierce the silence. Witnesses have described the sound as that of a little girl lost and alone in the cold darkness. And then there are the unexplained touches that some people experience in the tunnel. It's usually just a gentle caress on their shoulders, as if an unseen hand reaches out to the living. Over its lifetime as a military fort, the Halifax Citadel has housed thousands of soldiers, their wives, prisoners, and visitors, and it has produced more than its share of ghost stories and mysteries, like the sound of phantom footsteps that resonate from a walled-in staircase, and the unexplained sounds of metallic rattling and creaking hinges that come from the old garrison cells where prisoners were once held. Some of the stories are creepy, some are gruesome. One time in the 1850s, the soldiers found body parts in the drinking water, and it all stemmed from a case of murder and revenge. There was a dominating sergeant who had singled out a particular private to bear the brunt of his abuse. The private killed the sergeant one night and dumped his body into the well. He was able to do it on a night when fire broke out in the city, and the soldiers at the fort were called on to assist. And in all of the confusion, the private was able to commit the murder and dispose of the body without being seen. At roll call the next day, both men were missing, the sergeant and the private. They later found out the private had deserted and escaped to the United States. They didn't know what had happened to the sergeant, but the water tasted bad though. They eventually found a body in the well that was wearing a sergeant's rank. Some believe one ghostly figure that's seen strutting with a drill cane under his arm but vanishes when anyone approaches him could be the spirit of the slain sergeant looking for justice. Yeah, so you just want to uh, get situated at the bottom of the uh, ladder there. We greatly appreciate it. They saw a ghost, Tim. We hear one more ghost story, which really turns out to be more of an unsolved homicide at the Citadel. Okay. Uh, so we're now inside of the defensive ditch. Uh, this was the first line of defense in case an enemy did attack. They'd have to come through this ditch no matter where they entered around the fort. Uh, that's because that bridge right there was historically just like a drawbridge. So you'd take that out during combat and then again, you have to jump off the wall, probably break your legs uh, if you forgot a ladder. If you're smart enough to bring one, you know, you'd gently climb down and then get peppered with rifle fire and cannon fire coming from those roofs up there. So it was a, again, luckily never used since the fort was never attacked, uh, but just in case, so this would not be a good place to be. If you wanted to get inside of the fort, you'd either have to, again, use a ladder to climb up that wall, which I don't think anybody in their right mind would try and do, but uh, the best idea would just to be start chucking barrels of gunpowder down here and hopefully blow up that wall, climb up the rubble, and then you're in the fort. Again, a bit of an extreme case. It's also the uh, site of our next, uh, not necessarily ghost story, but kind of like a mystery here at the fort that's still unsolved to this day. So. November of 1900, uh, it was the first snowfall of the year recorded in Nova Scotia, which for that time is kind of late, but it gets pretty cold here in October. Um, so again, it's snowy, there's snow banks inside of the ditch, a uh, rather large one just on the corner of the wall where it starts to go around. It's early, early in the morning, it's roughly 4 a.m., so it's still dark outside, and the sentry post at the main gate was taking his beat. So he's taking his beat, and he sees this kind of, you know, very, very dark, can't make it out very well, but he sees this lump inside of the ditch. He can't make out what it is, but it's early in the morning. He's been, you know, pounding back black coffee all, all day. Uh, so he's just, you know, saying he's hallucinating or something. He's almost done his stand, so 
um, it's not really his problem. So again, he's changed out for the next guard at around 4 a.m. And uh, this time, again, the next sentry is out and about, and he's been told that there's something in the ditch to keep his eye out for. Now it's about 6 a.m., he's almost done his next stand, and the sun's up just enough to see a figure inside of the ditch. So he takes one beat, again, doesn't really make anything of it, but takes another one just to double check on what it is. And when he goes to the bridge, he stops just about halfway where that kind of white pole is. He looks down, he sees a woman laying face down inside of the snowbank. All she has on is just like a nightgown and that's it. So he goes back into the guard room where we just were, tells all the soldiers inside exactly what he saw, and then they all come down the exact same path that we took down that sally port and over to the body just on the corner. Now they flip her over and they notice her face has been ripped off completely. Now no one has a clue who this woman is, uh, or why she's again dead inside of the ditch, but she is a civilian, so the Halifax police were called in uh, instead of like the military uh, investigating this as a military case. The police come up and they look around for hours, but they don't find any clues or anything like that. There's no uh, footprints on the side of the hill. Uh, there's no footprints inside of the ditch. This woman doesn't have a face, so no clue who she is. Um, they don't know when she died or how she died. Again, probably blood loss, but. Um, they really have no clue what happened. It's, it's almost as if she just appeared inside of this ditch. So after a couple hours looking around, they just record in their journal, you know, woman found dead in Halifax, defensive, Halifax still defensive ditch, and that's it. Uh, it's a closed case. Still to this day, nobody has a clue who this woman is. Uh, there's no recorded missing persons from that time, uh, from November of 1900. Again, it's, uh, it's still a cold case. So and the fort's greatest mystery, if you want to call it that. Our journey through the haunted past led us to a different kind of spirits, a whiskey tasting that brought warmth to the chilly night. Lovely, lovely sights ahead of you, and thanks so much for joining us today at the Citadel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.